så kommer då Cesar Milstein. Imorgon så kommer han att vara argentinare. Han är en av dem som har dubbla medborgarskap. Cesar Milstein arbetar vid berömda Cambridge universitetet i England, alltså född i Argentina. Det är en juicio kontrafaktual. Vad hade passat om han hade kvar här? Y probablemente no hubiera llegado a hacer una contribución tan importante como la que hizo. ¿no? Porque uno es uno y sus circunstancias. Las circunstancias que le tocó vivir luego en el Reino Unido fueron muy favorables para que él pudiera eh, ver florecer y fructificar eh, esas ideas originales que tenía. Y de alguna forma el desarrollo de los anticuerpos monoclonales es una contribución de la, de la ciencia argentina eh, a la humanidad. Eh, que también implica un reto para el país. que a diferencia de los dos premios Nobel, el Trotsky no tuvo una contribución científica tan importante y la primera prioridad era eh, democratizar las instituciones, democratizar el CONICET, eh, asume Carlos Abeledo como presidente del CONICET y es un periodo difícil porque había realmente mafias enquistadas en el CONICET. El doctor Manuel Sadowski vuelve a la Argentina y el presidente Alfonsín lo nombra secretario de Ciencia y Tecnología. En ese momento era Secretaría de Ciencia y Tecnología, hoy es Ministerio de Ciencia. Sadowski es como un resplandor que aparece después de tanto oscurantismo que habíamos tenido durante el gobierno militar. Manuel Sadowski lo, lo consulta, vino varias veces, era muy difícil movilizar y reestructurar el sistema científico argentino en su conjunto y había que empezar creando centros donde realmente se hiciera ciencia de punta. Eh, de hecho, de alguna forma, el centro del de Intech en, en Chascomú se crea sobre esta base. Hay que crear un, una nueva institución donde uno elige eh, aquellos personajes que, que piensa que son más productivos o que tienen un mayor nivel de excelencia y sobre esa base, sobre esos cristales, comienza a construir eh, una nueva estructura. Esa impronta que intentó dar César no cuajó del todo, más que en algunos casos aislados. Pero era muy difícil el contexto. Hay que entender que, eh, tanto desde el punto de vista político y económico global como de la propia comunidad, eh, se necesitaba tiempo para que esto ocurriera, no se dan cambios de esa magnitud en forma eh, instantánea. So in the mid 1980s other people working around you were starting to take the monoclonal antibody story a step further with the concepts of antibody engineering. First Mike Neuberger making chimeric antibodies and then Greg Winter with humanization of antibodies, things that have proved to be very important from a practical and clinical applications. How did you interact with, with those people at that time? Well, the, the story of the antibody engineering starts really uh, around 1980. Uh, in fact, if I, uh, when I, I gave a talk at the Royal Society, And in that talk, I uh, begin to explore uh, the ways in which monoclonal antibodies are going to go further. And one of the issues I raise there is the possibility of uh, combining monoclonal antibodies with genetic engineering. And it was the time when uh, Mike Neuberger was applying to come to the lab. In 1980, he gave a lecture where he foreshadowed, foresaw the use of how antibody technology could be improved by combining it 
with a recombinant DNA technology, and that happened in the following decades. In the way of therapy, clinical therapy, I think it opened up things which had never really been possible before. I think he had the joy of seeing the use of antibodies really blossom. And I think it was in, over the next few years that people saw the potential of them in therapy. Los anticuerpos, teniendo esta característica de reconocer prácticamente cualquier cosa, eh, eh, si yo quiero saber si eh, tengo, por ejemplo, una infección de un particular virus, una posibilidad es ir a buscar el virus. La otra posibilidad es ver si yo, con mi anticuerpo, puedo ver alguno de los componentes del virus y me, eso me da una indicación de que yo tuve en contacto con el virus. Un cero positivo para el virus de HIV, el virus del SIDA, significa que uno tiene componentes del virus en la sangre y uno los ve con un test que se hace con un anticuerpo monoclonal. Women who are pregnant secrete a hormone called HCG into their urine. And so a very a way of detecting whether a lady is pregnant very early on is detecting HCG in her urine. And so that has become one of the early major uses of monoclonal antibodies, and they underpin those early pregnancy testing kits. If I wanted to type your blood and give you a blood transfusion and know if you were O or A or AB, then again, early on they devised, made antibodies specific for these, for the A or B subgroups, and so you could type deep people's blood and very quickly tell what subgroup they were. You could use them for measuring all sorts of hormones, thyroxine, insulin, and all sorts of medically relevant hormones. This was the tissue culture, and this is where all the monoclonal lines used to be made. What you see here is all the tissue culture supernatant from the cell lines, and then he's trying to purify the protein using a column. So basically there is a, I think it's pro probably protein A or protein G, which is binds the antibody selectively, and then he will elute the antibody, so it's passing all the supernatant through the column to concentrate the antibody. So basically, we're still using the same technique. The process is exactly the same as it was originally done by Cesar. In biology terms, the very precise specificity enables you to develop lots of tools for diagnostic. It has been a huge tool for biology. It just revolutionized a lot of biology. We used to have to make them ourselves. Now you can buy, as I say, thousands of them off the shelf. As tools for research, it's just completely invaluable. I mean, all cell biology work really has advanced enormously. Once you can detect specifically the, the molecule that you're looking at, purify it, you can... It's an incredible revolution. I think we're just not aware of how much it is. That's been the big use of antibodies in what you would call diagnostics, but they've also been very attractive for therapy. If you can find a molecule on the surface of a tumor cell, of a cancer cell, that distinguishes it from other cells, then if you make an antibody against that molecule, you can use it to destroy the tumor cell. Y existen ya algunos anticuerpos monoclonales que están en el mercado y que sirven para atacar células tumorales particulares. There are now about 17 antibodies approved by the FDA. The biggest use really has been in um, in attacking not viruses or bacteria, but in attacking normal human proteins as you get on cancer cells or you get on in inflammation. Synagis is a humanized antibody used to treat um, 
respiratory syncytial virus infections in children. And so in the States, they, they give to people, particularly to children, this antibody which protects against the virus. Um, they do that you know, whether or not they have an infection, so it's used in prophylactically just because it's quite common for children to get these life-threatening infections. Campath, it was originally used for treating um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but now that antibody has got approved for B-cell um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and they've also been using it for treating multiple sclerosis. Herceptin is used against breast cancer. Zolaire is an antibody which is used to deal with um, um, asthma. Remicade is an antibody against uh, TNF. At the moment, uh, only we, we only see a, a tip of an iceberg. Antibodies can, can be tremendously important in uh, uh, helping to control an, a large number of very, very important diseases. Estas son anteriores, pero, claro, ya en el 81 se hablaba del Nobel, de la posibilidad del Nobel de César. Se contaban los premios porque él iba, iba teniendo algunos premios importantes y entonces le escribió, el premio Nobel pegó en el palo, se ve que le escribió eso a mi papá. Fue el segundo año en que los periodistas me aseguran que me tocó a mí. Cuando estuvimos en Japón, el año pasado en octubre, me atacaron con cámara de televisión y todo, como si fuera un político famoso, un artista de cine, en el medio de un escándalo. La verdad, no me divierte para nada. El mejor chiste lo hizo un amigo mío. Los premios Nobel son como los grandes vinos. Mejoran con el tiempo y hay que dejarlos madurar antes de tomarlo. La macana es que un buen día se hace en vinagre. I was in October, I was in Japan, and uh, the Japanese press must have heard that I was very high or something. And they actually told me, you got the, no the, the Nobel Prize, what is your, what, what, do you, what, what do you want to say? What is your comment or something? And I said, I haven't heard of that. Well, yes, it has just been announced and so on. They kept saying that. I, it, it wasn't true, actually. Uh, but I, I fortunately, you know, I didn't get very excited by that. I told them, look, I, I, I don't know anything about that. I haven't heard. I didn't even know that the Nobel Prize was being given. And, well, it's not. It's tomorrow, actually, but it is already decided. I said, how do you know? <laughs> and they said, oh, we know, you know, this, we tend to know these things in advance and so on. It turned out that uh, uh, it, 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 it was not true. Uh, so I was, I was aware, yes, that something must be happening. It was in the, in the lab, in the and lab. that was the first bottle of champagne for the, when the Nobel Prize was announced. Yes. Mm. So since then you were working with him? Oh, yeah. Since then? Before since, it? Yes, before. <laughs> 1963, September. I was the first to know it. A person who was a member of the academy phoned me to the lab to tell me. And I was, you know, I couldn't sort of react. So immediately, first thing I did was to try to call Cesar. And... Uh, I can't remember who answered the phone, whether probably it was Judy who answered the phone, and she told me he's not here. And so I said to her, well, tell him to phone me as soon as he comes back. You know, instead of saying, call him because this is really <laughs> great news, like a stupid, you know, I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> that day was... Clouded in mystery. <laughs> no. It was um, it was it, during the week of the lab talks that we have, and I hadn't gone to the talk. Cesar religiously went to 
to all the talks. And then in, in 1984, when, when you actually won the Nobel Prize together with George Curler and Niels Jerner, what did that feel like? Oh, uh, uh, it, it, all these things that I more or less knew that something may be happening, as it was totally irrelevant. I received the news as if it was completely, uh, uh, as I, it would have been the same if I had been uh, totally unaware. I, it just really was like a shock, uh, really came like a shock. Yeah, and it was a funny a circumstance because uh, the, uh, it was the, 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 the week of the annual talks in the lab. And, uh, and uh, I, was I was listening to, I think, Hugh Huxley was giving a talk. And, um, and suddenly, uh, Sidney Brenner comes you in those with his stick, sort of like that. Yeah in the air and comes sort of down and said, stop, I have an announcement to make. And then he says that, and it was like a bomb to me. I mean, I really was like an explosion. I really didn't know where I was. Uh, I, it, was an, it was nice, actually, that I didn't know that day was going to be decided, actually. And I remember going to meet him, coming from the lecture. He was coming up the stairs, um, the usual thing, congratulations, everything. Yeah. He said, I want pink champagne. Claro, ese día que eh, ellos se enteran allá, eh, la noticia corrió muy rápido, por lo menos para Argentina también. Eh, y yo estaba yendo a Neuquén, <ríe> yo vivía en Chiporito y estaba yendo a Neuquén en el auto. Y, y la verdad que yo no tenía la costumbre de escuchar la radio. Pero en general la gente tiene la costumbre de escuchar la radio a la, a la mañana, especialmente los que andan en el auto. Entonces llegué un, al, a la puerta de la obra social donde tenía que buscar algo, un trámite. Y me encontré con un alumno mío de Bellas Artes, un hombre grande, ¿no? Yo trabajaba en el profesorado. Y, y me vio y me preguntó si yo tenía algo que ver con el Milstein Premio Nobel. Y, Claro, yo en esa época no tenía teléfono, o sea, no me podían llamar inmediatamente por teléfono para avisarme. O sea, tardó mi papá en avisarme a mí porque era todo un problema llegar a avisarse las cosas muy rápido. Y ahí me enteré, absolutamente de casualidad. Yo ya ahí confirmé que era, porque no podía haber otro Milstein Premio Nobel, ¿no? No, ¿no? no dudé quién era, pero fue como una cosa así de no poder compartirlo enseguida con todo. Pero bueno, la noticia se desparramó eh, y, y se festejó mucho. En, en el lugar donde yo vivía se festejó, la gente estaba muy contenta. So this picture is first Hurdy got his Nobel Prize. The funny story about this bottle of champagne is that it had been stored away in Mike Neuberger and Franco Calabi's lab, because I think it belonged to Franco. It was a great moment. I says I always said, oh, you should celebrate before it's too late. Immediately you hear something good, you should celebrate in case something less good happens. But the bottle of champagne in question, apparently Franco, when he discovered that they had taken the champagne, said, but I thought we were saving it for something important. We all knew Cesar would get a Nobel Prize at some point. So <laughs> anyway, it was, it, was a, it was a great day. When I was moving to Argentina, when I was raising the house, we found that we had a bottle of champagne that we had bought in France, very good. 
y que la teníamos para alguna ocasión importante, y se ve que no, tu, no la tuvimos la ocasión. El asunto es que yo antes de irme la llevo al laboratorio y se la dejo a este amigo Franco Calab y le digo, mirá Franco, el próximo experimento interesante que haya, festejen, y yo les dejo la botella de champán. Eh, y Franco la guardó y el año siguiente, en el 84, cuando a César le dan el premio Nobel, Franco llega al laboratorio y dijo, esta la dejó Oscar, así que festejaron con, con el champán que yo había dejado. So kom lo César Milstein. So mi da har bett att få ha Storbritannien som hemland. Imorgon så kommer han att vara argentinare. Han är en av dem som har dubbla medborgarskap. Cesar Milstein arbetar vid berömda Cambridge universitetet i England, alltså född i Argentina. Milstein, acá tenemos la posibilidad de mandarle algunas palabras para el día ese que esté en Estocolmo, lo vamos a recordar mucho. Le mandamos muchas felicitaciones y esperamos que sigan los éxitos. They went to get the Nobel Prize in December, that would have been, and they were at the dinner, and says I sat next to the Queen of Sweden, and um, they were talking about fungus and collecting mushrooms in the woods, and, and um, says I said that he'd seen our fungus knife. And um, the next day, when they were at the Grand Hotel, the, uh, some palace official came round with a special knife that the Queen had bought for César at the uh, local store. Él dice, está bien, el descubrimiento se hizo, yo lo hice junto con Georges, pero hay un montón de trabajo detrás, antes y después, que contribuyó a eso. Es es como valorar el trabajo por arriba de, de lo personal. Claro, claro. Mm. I'm sorry that I am the third one to speak to tonight, uh, partly because you may have in a number of bits of my talk, this uh, sense of déjà vu, and partly uh, because uh, you may begin to be wondering when are we going to have our refreshments. <clears throat> Yet, I must do my job. I've been <laughs> well paid to do that. Uh, so let me start. What about the, all the invitations and the tremendous well, demands? Well, yes, I, I, I had already sort of trained myself quite a bit say, to say no to things. So I kept saying no to many more things than before. And but uh, it was, uh, the first year is a difficult one. Everybody wants to have you and to be a, a star presenter, and they still do that. Um, I've learned to say no. Mm -hmm.